Welcome to the Doctor Patient Forum, a no holds barred patient advocacy podcast discussing why millions of pain patients continue to suffer, but most importantly, who caused the suffering. Join us weekly as we discuss how you can help end the untreated pain crisis. Today we'll be talking to Mark Sheeran, who has started the Freedom Model of Addiction. And after listening to the podcast, after we recorded it, I realized that we really didn't explain exactly what it is. We really talked a lot about what it isn't. So I'm going to read just a little synopsis at the beginning here, just to give you a general idea of what it is. I want to tell you that we do not agree with everything in this model. Mark had reached out to Claudia. We definitely have a lot of common ground. There's a lot of things we do agree with each other on, but I will be interjecting some thoughts throughout the podcast Um, just to kind of give you a little idea of where we are and what we think and how we think about it. Our views of addiction, I would have to say, have been evolving for years because, you know, and you hear me say this all the time, when we first started getting into this, I had a very stigmatized view of people who use drugs. And, you know, it, it took a lot of sitting back and listening to experts on the subject talk about it, people with lived experience, and really to learn from them to realize that we're all kind of a one stigmatized group and the pain patients are being treated the way we are because of the way people with addiction have always been treated. That stigma has not been removed from people who use drugs. It's just been expanded to pain patients. So I think it's it's extremely important that we kind of join forces and realize we're not two separate groups fighting against each other. We have different needs and we are different in that sense that we have different diagnoses or different issues, but we are all fighting against really, really bad drug policy and really, really bad failed war on drugs. And I hate this whole idea of like, are you a legitimate pain patient? Are you not? It just bothers me because it it just, the whole concept bothers me. I'm so tired of hearing it, tired of seeing doctors try to determine who's a drug seeker and who's not. The whole thing bothers me. But anyway, I didn't mean to go off on that tangent. So I'm going to read a little bit here about what the freedom model is. It's titled, The Answer to the Failing Treatment Establishment. The freedom model is a way of thinking about choices you can and will make in your own life. The freedom model debunks all of the addiction and recovery myths so you can happily choose one of three options. To continue to use heavily, use moderately, whatever that means to you, or to abstain, and to freely choose your options based on the facts and confidence, not fiction and fear. By doing so, anyone can be completely free to move on in his or her life without those constructs holding him or her back and keeping them needlessly trapped in an endless addiction recovery addiction cycle. The freedom model renders the misleading concepts of addiction and recovery as obsolete and unnecessary in both one's personal life and as cultural constructs. Constructs that keep the mass is blind to the solutions that exist within the individual. While the freedom model is a book, it is the research and the message contained on those pages that are real solution to an individual's struggle with drugs and alcohol. As researchers Mark Sheeran, Stephen Slate, and Michelle Dunbar have spent decades working together building the freedom model and all the public service offshoots of the book, it grew out of the more than three decades of working and living with those they were helping find solutions to their complex struggles. They too struggled at one time with substance use habits, but came to realize that the research provided answers that made personal change easy, efficient, and enjoyable. If someone is ready to change their life and wants to be free from addiction, treatment, and recovery, then the freedom model addictions is the answer. So again, you may be wondering, well, why are Claudia and Bev having this person on today? I've really been focusing a lot more on the fact that we need to join forces with those. We're not going to agree with everything anyone says. We're just not. But we do have common ground with a lot of groups, with a lot of different communities, and I think it's time that we join forces with those we agree with and really try to fight together against the things that we don't agree with together. I hope that explains a little bit. Again, I will be interjecting my thoughts throughout the podcast just to give you a little idea so you know the things that we do and don't agree with. I don't expect you to agree with us 100%. I'm asking you to please not attack Mark in the things that you don't agree with him on. And, you know, we're always attacked, but I would like for you not to attack us too um, on the things you don't agree with us on. So, okay, here we go. Hey there, folks. Welcome to this episode of the Doctor Patient Forum podcast. I'm Claudia Mirandi, my colleague, Bev Schechtman. We're so thrilled that you took time out of your day to listen to this episode. Don't forget, if you like what you heard today, be sure to leave us 
star review. We love five star reviews. So a question that is often broached, I see this especially on TikTok, is addiction a choice or is it a disease? And most importantly, does the addiction recovery industry help addicts or does it create addicts? And that is the topic of today's show. Don't forget, folks, please only leave respectful comments because I imagine after we upload this podcast, shit's going to go down. Uh, and I'm accustomed to this, and I'm sure both of our guests are accustomed to it. What, welcome, Mark Sharon and Michelle bon- Dunbar. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Hi. <laughs> so you guys, you've co-founded the Baldwin Research Institute, and you have a book out. And the name of the book is called The Revolutionary Book, The Freedom Mind addictions escape the treatment and recovery trap so congratulations on your new book well thank you we we published it in 2017 uh but it took me Stephen slate he's the other co-author he, he's an awesome uh researcher and michelle it took us uh, about 27 years to write that book um, yep we had um, to get we had to get all the research together but why it took us so long is because we all started deeply, deeply entrenched in the treatment and recovery paradigm. And we were incredibly lost in it and dissatisfied. And in all our cases, it almost ended tragically with suicide attempts and overdoses. So, and then we matriculated out of that as researchers. We, we knew something was terribly wrong with the model. And this was in the 80s and early 90s. And we said... We didn't know each other in those days. We each collectively figured out, you know, something's wrong here. We're going to, we're going to challenge this and find out the truth. And it took us a long time to unravel the entire industry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because Mark, you sent me an email about a week ago. And as soon as we get hundreds of emails, as soon as I got this email, I text take a look at the email that we received. This is going to be a little bit controversial, but Uh, It's a discussion that needs to be had because let's face it, uh, buprenorphine's being forced down the throat of not only people with substance use disorder, but pain. And that's how you, that's why you reached out to me. And I agree with a lot of the, the things that you mentioned. Bev and I just had this conversation before we came on the air. You know, is addiction a choice? Are people getting high because they want to, or is it because they're predisposed to a life of doom and gloom. And I think this is a conversation that needs to be had. There is a big demand for people who want to, I guess, go through recovery and not be handcuffed to a medication. And and this sounds like something that you guys can assist with. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, ahead, absolutely. What, what happened, we, we actually were... Um, we know the person that started the harm reduction movement and he used to be, he was on our board of directors and you know, it, it was the movement itself was actually quite positive. It was, it was all about letting go of this all or nothing idea that, that people struggling with addiction, you know, had to, it was, had to just cut themselves off completely from all substances. And it, and it really was about, you know, how can I, how can I reduce my usage to non problematic levels? That's kind of how that, that movement started. And unfortunately what's happened to it, it was, it was literally, hijacked by the pharmaceutical company, by the treatment industry. What it is now is, oh, you know, the best we can offer people that are addicted is to put them on a medication that is supposedly supposed to stop them from wanting to get high off their drug of choice. And, you know, because the best people can ever hope for is is, you know, they're always going to want to get high. So the best they can hope for is something that is, that is less harmful to them. And that's, a, that's yeah. crazy though. That's like a huge, like, that's the biggest crock of shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> exactly. It's, right. It's like, they're, it's, I almost feel like the government wants to keep people down. Yes. Like you'll never be more than a drug addict. So just take your buprenorphine and shut up. Exactly. That's exactly what it what it's become. It, so much so. Let me let me explain something that you're gonna you're gonna find remarkable. Is Suboxone was specifically there to replace methadone because 
people started dying from methadone overdose at alarming rates um, in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, and because they were putting everybody on methadone. And so now Suboxone came to, to replace methadone. It is an effective drug for helping people to withdraw, you know, from, and, heroin. from heroin. So they did right. taper people, right? But all of a sudden it started being marketed as this cure. Yeah. Addiction disease medication. So now they're, they're, Subscri- uh, prescribing it to people that were on methamphetamine, to people that are on benzodiazepines, which could literally kill them because mm-hmm. it, it doesn't help people to detox up benzodiazepines. Um, and in even alcohol in some cases. And it's just remarkable to me that doctors will prescribe this long term to people. And also now as a pain medication, which as many people who've been prescribed methadone or Suboxone, they know it's not very effective. Yeah. I just want to interject a few thoughts here as I was editing this. Some things came to mind. I want to say that we are 100% supportive of people with OUD to have access to Suboxone, to have access to methadone, to have access to things that help them. We believe that whatever it is that's going to help them, they should have access to and should not be stigmatized for using. This concept that everybody who has opioid use disorder is going to need Suboxone to stop using and stay in it for the rest of their lives or else they will just continue to use and destroy their lives, in my mind, is wrong. Because one thing that isn't discussed a lot is the percentage of people that actually at one point or another would have qualified for having a use disorder that stop on their own. And they do, don't need anything to stop. I'm not sure of the statistic. I think it's 80 to 90% do end up stopping without getting any kind of assistance. What we're talking about here is something that seems to be driven by industry. And you'll hear repeatedly, it talked about that industry pharma uh, pushed opioids for pain and they drove the narrative. And that's why we're in the position we're in today, which is ridiculous. But no one seems to care about in Divier. No one seems to care about Suboxone. No one seems to care that on the board of groups like Shatterproof, you have Tom McClellan, who is also on the board of Indivier. No one seems to care that Indivier highly funds a- ASAM and that they're pushing bup for everything. You know, no one seems to question the fact that the VA just put out these updated guidelines for pain saying that nobody should be on opioids for chronic pain except for Buprenorphine, which is a Suboxone, Subutex, and then there's some other product. Why is nobody questioning this? Why does nobody care about this type of industry funding or this type of skewed narrative that has no evidence to back it up? So uh, I just want to say that I do 100% believe in access to Suboxone or Methadone for addiction. I also know of some people that it has helped for pain. But I do want to say there is a huge push now to put everybody on Suboxone for pain and take them off of full agonist, which there's no evidence to support it. And in a lot of patients, it doesn't help. And then they do have a hard time coming off of it. You're taking stable patients on a way lower dose of opioids and putting them on an opioid that's higher, that's not going to help as much. It just doesn't make any sense. It, from what people tell us, it's not like Suboxone is savior. You know, in my opinion, the push for bup on pain patients was always about knock, knock OxyContin out and replace it with an inferior drug that failed miserably in the 70s for pain. So I feel a certain way mm. about being prescribed bup. So first, Michelle, I'm going to ask you and then I'm going to ask Mark. Michelle, you have a history of addiction, correct? Correct. Yep. And what was your drug or, of choice? Was it alcohol? Was it was it pills? I was a poly substance user. Alcohol, I ended up with just alcohol. Um, but early on, I used daily um, marijuana, PCP, opiates. Mm-hmm. And occasionally, I would use amphetamines. Um, but that was definitely not my go-to thing. I also liked psychedelics. I used them pretty regularly. Um, but in the end, I quit all drugs six months before I quit drinking. Um, and so my last six months was just daily heavy drinking. Oh my goodness. Well, congratulations on where you are today. How about you, Mark? What's, what's your history? Yeah, I did everything. I started when I was 12 and I quit when I was 18, when I almost killed some people drunk driving and I was a daily drinker. I drank about a fifth of a whiskey or bourbon a day for about a year at the end. Um, and I was, I was very sick and suicidal and lost, but for, for five years, it was pot 
cocaine and, uh, you know, pills occasionally. Back in those days, it wasn't, I mean, we were just at the end run of quaaludes. You could still get quaaludes and things like that. So I was a downer guy. I like to just shut off yeah. and disappear for a little while. Yeah, we, um, we didn't get really sucked in. I mean, it was the 80s. So there was a yeah. lot of cocaine and crack going around. And I, that just wasn't my thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I smoked some cocaine occasionally with but I found that it, it always ended. Back. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I grew up in AA. I grew up with a mother that was a counselor. I grew up around the treatment industry. I was completely and totally immersed in a really crazy, crazy AA and treatment world. Um, when I was a little boy, they would bring me to halfway houses <clears throat> where my mother was working and they'd smuggle me in because she'd have me on weekends because I came from a divorced family. And so I would spend my weekends at either rehabs, visiting a sibling or in a halfway house for years, which is completely fucked up. I mean, I can't, <laughs> even, I can't even tell you how wacky that is. So well, I would it admit, is. It, it's a, it's very odd. Yes. And, but it gave me an unbelievably unbiased view or, or maybe biased, I suppose, but, but a really deep inside view of treatment and, and very few people in the world know the scams. I knew all the scams of treatment right. before I even entered it. And then I got sucked into the scam of treatment knowing it was a scam, but I was, I was stuck in treatment for 18 months because of the charges that were against me. So I, I know it from every angle before I even became a researcher, which was really a boon to the research. I, I would imagine the recovery industry is a billion dollar business because everywhere I look, there is a Suboxone clinic. Oh, and, yeah. And, and so I think early on in my advocacy, somebody asked me if I wanted to invest in a Suboxone clinic. And then I learned that these are just get rich quick businesses. Yeah. See, what's happened on the macro level is we have we now have, as you know, opiate prohibition. Right. They're not going to say it. But that's what it is. And that was to pay off lawyers and legislators with with the law that allowed them to sue. So they built this narrative based on they took they leveraged overdoses so that lawyers and legislators could make money. But then they were in bed with the pharmaceutical companies and the pharmaceutical companies said, well, if you're going to take us to task for, you know, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars in lawsuits, we need to replace that with a drug that can make up the losses. And that's why then they said, OK, let's let's create addiction medicine based on and this is what we really need to be talking about based on the myth that drugs and alcohol are a disease, the use of them is a disease, and that there's a loss of control. Those mythologies are so deeply embedded in our culture, and without those, those ideas uh, being mainstreamed, we wouldn't be talking today. People would just move on with their lives. But because of the loss of control, because of the disease concept, which are myths, they're lies, everything downstream that you're seeing that you're working on and that we're working on, uh, is happening. So we really need to tackle that belief. If we don't tackle that belief, everything you're doing is going to fall on deaf ears and you're going to have an uphill climb forever. Yeah. And that's pretty much where we, where we're stuck today. And I don't think people realize this, but Purdue makes buprenorphine. Of course. Uh, and, I, and you know, we know that they had to leverage the overdoses, not treating pain was always, it's just a, it's a political move is right. all it is. And oh, when I yeah. speak when I speak with lawmakers, it's, I'm like, holy shit, they have like a gloss over their eyes because they've been indoctrinated into believing if you take a pill, you'll become a drug addict. Right. Uh, but you know, what's interesting in your book, uh, you mentioned that, talk a little bit about The sound cut out there, what Claudia was asking them is that in their book, they mentioned that they believe that treatment industry actually creates people with addiction and leads to addiction. So she was asking them to explain it. I did want to touch on a few things really quickly here. I think risk versus benefit needs to be weighed, obviously, with any treatment, with any medication, and it needs to be to, like geared toward that individual. So when a pain patient says, I don't want to take Suboxone, I've been stable on, on oxycodone for years, there's really not evidence to show that switching them to Suboxone is the right thing to do. But when a pain patient says, I don't want to take Suboxone, that can appear to be stigmatizing to people with addiction. 
That's not what we need. People with addiction absolutely need to have access to Suboxone if that's what, what works for them. I mean, the evidence shows that it works, right? That it definitely saves lives. So people with addiction should have access. But there is absolutely zero evidence showing long-term effect of Suboxone for pain. It's not even on label. And it absolutely is no evidence showing taking a stable patient off of a full agonist and putting them on Suboxone is the right thing to do. But yet, that's what's happening. As far as how uh, big of an industry is the treatment industry, the last statistic I found in 2020 was a $42 billion a year industry. And now you have a lot of money, 38 to $40 billion flowing into the states from opioid litigation. Where's it going to go? There's a lot of boards explaining, you know, determining where it goes. But the problem is, is it going to go to, to actual harm reduction? Or is it going to go to orgs and law enforcement and things that are going to further the war on drugs? and make things worse because I've already seen, like I think New Jersey's putting like 1.4 million into bolstering the prescription drug database, which is an issue. A lot of, it's probably gonna go to law enforcement and it's gonna just be this furthering of this war on drugs, which is going to cause more of a problem than it's going to help. So I do hope it goes to actual harm reduction efforts to save lives and the thing that there's evidence, but I don't know, I'm not, I'm not so, so sure that that's what's gonna happen. Treatment was created from the 12 step program that it, Bill Wilson, literally his movement from the 1930s, you know, the idea that you're powerless, the first step of A is that you're powerless. He was such an amazing marketer that he, he proliferated this very strange idea, this idea that people do things, that they ingest a substance against their will, that they, that the substance has power over them. I mean, if you, if you stand back and you think about it critically, it really makes zero sense. Um, you know, Substance use is always volitional. And the research shows us this over and over and over again. But there was nothing else. You, you know, people would look at the the drunk that was on the street that seemed to be drinking himself to death for no apparent reason. And they think, why would somebody do that? He must have a disease. He must be sick. But then they don't look at the person that jumps out of airplanes, you know, with a parachute, you know, who maybe had an accident doing it and then gets up and does it again. They don't look at that person and think that person must be sick. Right. Diseased and powerless over getting in the airplane. Right. So, so, the, you know, we got this very strange narrative. So all treatment is based on it. Mark could not graduate from his, he, from his treatment program until he admitted that he was powerless. Right. They, they kept. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was in, I was mandated, and I was in this outpatient clinic in a mental hospital, which is b a bizarre in and of itself. I had already quit drinking on my own. I detoxed myself in a dorm room bathroom for three days, which was really dangerous and not fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then six months later, the courts caught up with me. I was homeless at the time, and they said, listen, you're, you're going to go to treatment. Every this day. is all from a DWI. This is all from my first DUI. Now, I did have a lot of charges against me. I fought the cops and all that kind of stuff. So, so... Now I'm in treatment and they said, you have to say you're powerless. I said, I'm not, I quit. And they said, well, you have to. And I said, I'm not gonna do that. So for a year I fought with the counselors, literally for a year, I would sit in group therapy. They would browbeat me. They would do every known thing to try and fear me into believing this. And then they said, and I got, to, I just said, well, I'm gonna bide my time, get to my year and get my license and get the fuck out of here, you know? And then, mm -hmm. we got to, and then we got to the year and they said, well, you're being non-compliant, Mr. Sharon. You're not admitting, you're, you're not embracing your disease. Uh, we're going to add 30 days. And I had no recourse. You don't have rights. You don't have constitutional rights. I didn't know that could happen in America. This is the Gestapo. That's what this is. So, so in order for me to have my freedom and my license back, I said, okay, fuck you. I'll do the 30 days and I'm going to stick to my guns because I'm the kind of kid that was always a fighter. Mm -hmm. And slowly... They said, I, we got to the end of that 30 days. They said, no, nope, haven't embraced your disease yet. You're going to, you know, and so they did this over and over for the next six months and they beat me. They beat me. They, they beat me. And I just, I, they, they worked on me so much that I, I started to believe their narrative. I started to rewrite my own history. It was really bizarre. What was happening? I was totally institutionalized by this point. Mm -hmm. And I gave up, I gave up my own mind and at that point i said okay i'm an alcoholic and they all clapped and congratulations 
and I, I and, and yeah, and taking on that identity like that's a positive oh, thing. And then God. I went and then I went home to my mother's house. I took out my hunting rifle and I put it in my mouth. Oh my and, God! And because uh, I I just was like I'm not living like. I mean, he was only 18 years old. Yeah, and sure, you, you're, I, I have yeah. a life sentence now, right? Yeah. I have a life sentence where I'm always going to struggle because that's the whole narrative. You're going to struggle, Mark. It's a battle with addiction. And I, now, mind you, I had already quit on my own before I ever went to treatment. For six months. And I was completely, my life was, not, I was homeless, but I was on an upward trajectory. I was getting an apartment. I had a job. I was, I, I, you know, I'm doing this all on my own, by myself, you know, with no license, no money, and rebuilding my life. And here I was with a gun in my mouth. And that was the beginning of the freedom model because I had a moment of clarity. Literally, right before I pulled the trigger and blew my head off, I said, oh, my God, I was better before treatment. And then yeah. I was like, I'm going to find out why. And that's that was 34 years ago. So, yeah, treatment is not designed. None of this. Suboxone isn't designed to help people. It's, it's designed to create a narrative that there is addiction medicine, that that it is a medical condition that your brain is biohacked and that you can't stop yourself. And what a great marketing campaign. I mean, what, per so they, they demonize one drug, which they realize they, they had to do. Mm. They replace it with another drug. They say, you can't have the one drug. Now you have to have the other one, both by the same manufacturer. Now, early you know, on, early on in my advocacy, a doctor said to me, this whole false narrative about opioids was created by Big Pharma. Of course. And so Big Pharma has always been driving the bus. Yes. yes. And, you know, how sad, because you were 18 years old. You're a baby at 18. Yes. And you, yes. You know, you both have been through, I mean, that's a life of hell. Oh, for, oh yeah. For, I mean, a boy, right? A 50, I mean, I'm a 50-year-old person, 54. I've got a 17-year-old. My daughter's never experienced such things i just said on a video i my daughter still asks me if she can have a snack for christ's sake so <laughs> but yeah. to hear that you folks have been through this and you found this amazing program and now you have this book this can be a lifesaver for many now let's not forget that medication assisted treatment has helped millions because there's this big push for matt uh have to acknowledge that because Every TikTok video I put out about uh, buprenorphine dental decay victims, people say, well, it's saved my life. So as much as it saves lives, there's a good number of people who want to come off of this. Like I said, so many people, they tell me, well, my medication saves my life. I can't lose my medication. It, it helps me. I'm back to work. I'm doing great things. But why do these people believe that? Mm, I, I think it does. I mean, Claudia, I really think, like you said, it has helped a lot of people. But I, I think the problem, in my opinion, is this either or like either or mentality where, you know, the hijacked, the hijacked brain disease model, a lot of that you say was created by pharma, which I agree, but also that was needed for this multi-district litigation which our country got like 38 billion That's dollars right. because they needed people to believe my son took one pill his brain was hijacked completely powerless it's pharma's fault right. and they they pushed it and the thing is it also and I probably will get attacked but I think they exploited parents grief because oh, you have of course they did these kids they feel horrible about it and they want to make it just like cut and dry. My son took an Oxycontin, my daughter took a Vicodin and then there was nothing they could have done. So the way we're going to fix this is we're going to go after opioids for pain and go after these companies and then everything's going to be okay. But here's the problem. This money is flowing into the state and it's going right back into the same programs that further addiction and further stigma. And that's the problem. They're gonna go right into bolstering like pres prescription drug, drug databases. They're gonna go into going after doctors so they can't prescribe opioids. And it's gonna go into a very unregulated addiction treatment industry where, I mean, I do think it's in the middle. I don't think your brain is hijacked and you have absolutely no control like you're a zombie. But I also don't 
think I also don't think it's 100% a choice. Like I think there's a lot that goes into what causes addiction and a lot that goes into treating addiction, but I'm with you. Like, I don't believe in the disease model. I don't believe like, like once you're like, you said you guys struggled with addiction. I don't think if you got into a car accident or or legs cut off and took a Vicodin, then automatically you're going to be right back where you were. Like, I think people can have a drink here or take pain medication, but they need this like hijacked brain model um, to push everything they're pushing. And man, our country has bought it. Oh, for sure. Well, go ahead. Go, now you go. Okay, so so there's a couple of things. It is 100% a choice. And that's what the research has shown over and over since 1950. And and we go over the, the myth of loss of control and the brain disease in Appendix A and B in, in spades in our book. It's hard for people to believe that because the narrative is so drastic and it's so hard for people who don't use heavily who don't have the preference to stick needles in their arms to understand that somebody would choose that it also we have been trained if you do use to deny that you like it so you're trained to people say what the fuck is wrong with you you're sticking a needle in your arm you have hepatitis you could get aids you know you're, you're you just had sepsis from the wound um, you're obviously not choosing this. Well, that that's that that's not an argument, and and the research doesn't back that up. It would be like a boxer who gets in the ring, gets knocked out, and then goes back in the ring. Would we say he's diseased because he ha- has a risky lifestyle? That's right. You've also had a lot of challenges in the past, Mark. You said that you had a billboard, and the state came down on you. What, what what's that been like for oh, you? Oh boy. <laughs> now Mark can talk about this. I we have we started saying, uh, you know, addiction isn't a disease in the early '90s, and that treatment doesn't work. And and I can remember my my dad actually founded uh, BRI Baldwin Research Institute with Mark. Um, I was still a substance user at the time. This was the late '80s. Um, I didn't stop everything until 1990. Michelle, why did you? But why were you using substances? Let's go back to there. Why? How did it all start? Um, I started also when I was 12. I think I I got drunk the first time when I was 12. I was raised in an AA household as well. My dad was a very heavy drinker until I was about nine years old. He was a very high functioning heavy drinker, a daily heavy drinker. He's a good Irishman. Um, I'm half Irish, half Italian. And so, it, you know, alcohol was a was a like a huge part of my life growing up. And whether it was because he was a heavy drinker and it was very, you know, much consumed in my household, or when he joined AA, which he was forced to do because of a DWI, because of like a fourth or fifth DWI, because um, that was the 1970s, and back then, you know, they would just pretty much bring you home in a small town. Um, mm-hmm. But but the last DWI he had, uh, they didn't bring him home; they threw him in jail. So well, can I ask, Michelle, was yeah. your dad was your grandfather also an alcoholic? My grandfather, his dad, my both my grandparents, my dad's parents were very heavy drinkers. My grandfather actually died in withdrawal from alcohol when I was 18. Oh, wow. oh my goodness. Yeah. So, so it was like that, the Irish side of the family, you were either, a, you were either an, as they say, an active alcoholic or you were in recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a, so, so I was also raised with this very strange dichotomy of alcohol is everything it's mm-hmm. or nothing and it's all powerful and it has these powers to relieve like anxiety relieved it's what you need after a hard day but it also has these powers to enslave you so alcohol was both the angel and the devil and that's what i learned growing up sure, and, and, sure. and that's a good segue for me to talk about what you are bringing up which is self-medicating yes so when when you say uh, people self-medicate. You don't even realize because you've been indoctrinated. <laughs> I'm sorry to say um, that alcohol is a medication or drugs are a medication that can relieve mental and emotional problems. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you something right now to show you that that's not even possible. So can a molecule? So can a molecule, a physical molecule? Let's say use alcohol as an example because it's the most widely used. Acetaldehyde goes into your brain tissue. Does it know? what you're feeling in your mind. Can it, can a molecule of acetaldehyde go and have the knowledge of the 
negative thoughts in your brain tissue and in your mind, which are two different things, the metaphysical realm of your thoughts. Could it, could it target that, know what you're thinking, and then medicate only the negative thoughts, amplify the positive thoughts in a moment in time, and then the next moment in time when you change your mind, it knows, oh, I better release that synapse <laughs> and then go attack this other synapse. Now, when we, when we start to parse things out that way, we start to realize, and neuroscientists know this, unless they're biased towards a pharmaceutical company, of course, they know that you can't, you can't, they don't even, they have no idea what alcohol does to the synapses. I mean, it's, it's, it's in its infancy. And we do know that our thoughts are free will run. We have a choice to think whatever the hell we want to think. So is alcohol and the drug, heroin, whatever it might be, is it an operative, intelligent, cunning, baffling, powerful thing? Or is it a substance that does fairly reliable things to brain tissue in a universal way that we then interpret in With our, our own mind as being a medication for my emotion? Do we interpret the experience of the physical sensation in magical ways because we've been taught by the marketing departments to do that? Just watch a... a a bush ad for bush beer. It makes the outdoors better. Bush, you know, and the horse is running, <laughs> right? And then Suboxone is told a medication that will make it so you don't crave. So you interpret, right. so you interpret the sensation of Suboxone. They give you just enough sure, of a sensation. Sure. Do you yeah. see? We so, call that an active placebo. Yes, these are. Th there is something happening, so it's active, but it's a placebo. So, so that, they they've that been you interpret. Duped. It sounds yes. like they've been duped. No, but I, everybody has been. Like yes. I, I definitely think we have a lot of common ground. I don't. I think some things we probably don't agree on. I mm -hmm. have. I've have heard from enough people who you know opioids have have been known for a long time to have antidepressive qualities in it. And so whatever's going on in the brain that helps cause depression, there's something in opioids that kind of can shut that off. So I do think there's something it's doing that helps people's at least depression and anxiety. And I think that, you know, there was a, there was a guy who was a heroin, um, he, he was addicted to heroin and he went on Suboxone and he since passed away. But he, he used to say all the time that he had such like, he had such bad depression that treatment resistant, like nothing helped him, nothing ever, ever, ever helped him no matter what, what he tried. And then he tried heroin once and it hit his depression went away. But I do think that there's something in it that does cause that. And I do think there's something in it that does, because I listened to some of your podcasts about like trauma and, and how you feel about that, not maybe not leading to addiction. But I do think there's something about checking out where it, it does make you not, it doesn't fix it, but it allows you to escape from it for those moments that you are either high or drunk. Well, I, I think what you're saying is, is, is true and real for it, but it's in, on an individualized basis and it's based on the individual's personal beliefs. It's based on how they interpret what they're feeling. But drugs, what the drugs can do is they either speed things up or slow things down within your body, within your brain. And some people experience, some people feel very good yeah. uh, antidepressant qualities from amphetamines and and because they interpret that speeding up of their functioning their brain functioning in a very positive way and that is the same thing for for any drug um alcohol slows things down benzodiazepines slow things down um and so if you interpret that in a way that oh i'm when i feel this little tickle in my brain. I, I like it. It makes me feel physically better or emotionally better. Um, then, then it becomes real. Now, what happens in the case of addiction is many of these drugs have these effects, but they build a tolerance in your system, opiates being one of them. And so you need more of the drug to feel that same tickle that same sensation that you enjoy, you need to keep doing more and more and more. Now, here's the other thing about it. If you believe you need that drug to feel that little tickle, and we know through research that people can feel that uh, little tickles and feel different in their minds from music, 
from yeah. exercise, from a whole lot of things. And, and where, where there's no chemical thing actually you're ingesting. If, if you believe you need a specific drug to do that, that's where addiction comes in. So that's, it's, it's almost like, I believe that you believe you need it. Yes, <laughs> yes, of course. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a, a, a research day that I have. Wait, can I ask one question before yeah, I forget? Sure. Yeah. I want to know how can, why is it that some people can have one drink and others need to continue to drink? Why is that? It's a personal preference. Okay. Yeah, wh- why did why did I keep getting in the ring and and get black sure. eyes? Right. Because right. I mean, it's a choice. They're make listen. I choose to have. All right. I get it. I'm but like, do I you it. not think that biological, like genetic? Do you do you not think genetic plays an influence in that at all? We, we yeah. know it doesn't. We yeah. We know no, it doesn't. doesn't. The research has never never shown that it did. I, I mean, here's. He, Here's a here's a little research point that that really debunks that fully right in one shot. Um, we know that uh, from the largest research done on addiction to date, which is the NISARC studies, um, we know that out of uh, you know that ninety point five percent of people that once qualified as having alcohol use disorder have st- have stopped at the point of their surveys and no longer qualified as alcohol use disorder and half of those people were moderate drinkers so at one point they qualified as having alcohol use disorder but then sometime down the road they no longer qualified for it and they are drinking moderately without issue mark and i are two examples of and, that and Stephen, all the and Stephen, yeah yeah yeah, we're, yeah we're i all... definitely think that people don't realize um that the majority of people who do at one point or another qualify for the DSM-5 criteria of substance use disorder, they, yep. stop on their own. they stop on their own. And most people don't realize that because, and pharmacists want people to know that probably also because, and the treatment industry doesn't want people to know that's that. That's right. That's right. That's so ab- absolutely agree true. With that. But I, we've seen enough people that it goes back in their family that I do, in my opinion, it's a bunch of different things. Like trauma doesn't cause it. Genetics doesn't cause it. Choice doesn't cause right. it. In my opinion, it's a ton of things all together um, that kind of are thrown in there that cause it. And I think anytime we try to separate it out and make it about one thing, it's usually has to do with trying to make money off of it. Well, there's a couple of things that that you said that we attack in the book in detail. One is we need to get away completely from the word cause because a drug doesn't cause behavior. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a reason. Yeah. So so if this fellow that you talked to talked about his depression and then he took that heroin, that one shot of heroin or whatever it was, we hear those stories all the time, too. And that's because. Uh, we live in Western culture that believes in the magic of drugs, that they are. I mean, you guys use the terms and you don't even realize you're using them. They're a part of our lexicon. So uh, self-medicate is is something that everybody knows, that, but they don't actually do that. It's an interpretation that they medicate you. And, and they can be a distraction. Uh, some people can use them. But the but it's a it's a reasoning process. It's you in control saying, you know what, I'm fucking leaving the world for a little while. I'm going to go lock myself in a hotel room for three days and shoot heroin or I'm just going to go to the bar. So I'm going to tell you a story that that makes this that set the research off and changed my life as a researcher and as a person and really made me understand all of this in one day. So Jerry says to me at the time, I'm 20 years old. That's my dad, Jerry. Yeah, who started the research. He goes, I want you to go down to the union in Schenectady. And I already talked to the bartender. You're going to sit in the corner. And I talked to the bartender because you're going to be sitting there with a notebook and I don't want him thinking you're a cop or something. (laughs) And you're going to sit in the corner and you're going to observe all the people that are drinking from 9 a.m. or from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. And you're going to describe how many drinks as best you can, what their behavior is, what they're doing. This is a college bar, too. (laughs) Yeah. So it's kind of a cop college bar it has a little bit of violence but it also is kind of a fun place it's kind of a cool place actually it's a place I have a it was a place i used to drink at. <laughs> yeah. so so i get down there and so i get back and i give him the report and he says well, so what did you find now i'm going to tell you what i found in general i said well there was a girl that was crying in her beard there was a guy who was hitting on her and trying to help her two people went in the bathroom and had sex Two guys came in, they got in an argument, they went out and they got into a little scuffle, which I found entertaining because I was a boxer. And, uh, you know, they ended up being police officers that were, you know, off duty and then a cop showed up. And so I went through all this behavior and it was everything from sex, fun. Oh, and then there was like five kids 
and two girls that were obviously in the dorms close by that were playing darts and they're all hitting on each other and having a blast. And he said, with all this varied behavior, how can one molecule make all that happen? Crazy. He said, mm -hmm. oh my God, we've been taught for centuries with alcohol mm -hmm. that it is a magical elixir and it is choose your own adventure. It's the angel and the devil. It's the angel and the devil. It's everything. So why and are people choosing it so, so frequently then, do you think? Well, I think the marketing is fantastic. And oh, I think for sure. I, it, so I think, Claudia, you said it. Life is a shitstorm of pain. Yeah. Right. And it's in its natural state. It's a constant struggle to be a human. And then you have somebody that comes along and, and Bush Beer says, Bush, go into the wild, you know, and you're like, find your beach, yeah. right? Yeah, Corona, find your, find your beach. Right. Or the, the guy <laughs> on the corner who says, listen, man, this heroin's like a warm blanket. And then you have guys like Gabor Mate peddling, you know, you all have trauma. This is this is why you it causes you know, a trauma causes so, which, which implies which, somehow that, that, that heavy substance use helps your trauma. Yes. Then the self-medication comes in. What a powerful, powerful idea. Right. That, that this drug can take your emotional state so and make it better. Up. There was, if there wasn't indoctrination, you're saying like, if there wasn't like the selling of this, this idea that people wouldn't choose to do it. Is that right. We know well, that not, the, not the to this extent. Well, their cultures in our book, go through the studies in the book. There's cultures that we studied where they drink heavier, more amounts at younger ages, oh, more yeah. per capita, and have no problems. If you look at the history of opiates themselves, yeah, I mean, they, you know, opiates have been around longer, as long as alcohol. I mean, and we just didn't have these problems. What you're saying is, you know, what's really interesting about this? What you're saying is exactly what the false narrative has said about opioids for pain. Do you know that? Like yes. they've actually said opioids don't work for pain. It's only because you're taught that it works for pain. It's pharmaceutical like indoctrination. Yeah, right, they reversed it. But, but opiates do work for physical pain. <laughs> no, they don't work for emotional pain. So it's interesting to me that they've taken something that you've said is like kind of a false narrative about, about addiction and they've come to oh, yeah it on its head and applied it to pain to the point where really chronic pain right now is considered in all honesty it's considered a mental illness yeah psych oh, issue that's right. yeah that's people right. with chronic pain it's strictly a psych issue you know i think one i that's think it was crazy. that beast yeah beast anna lemke or jane valentine said these oh. people they want to take their pain pills yeah. so and they feel like they have a warm blanket yep. wrapped around themselves they say it does not work for physical pain and the only reason people are saying works for physical pain is because they're told it works which is not true right yeah. but right. that's but that's so but you're a right that's a way great of demonizing point. the people and getting them to switch to suboxone it's oh all, look at it's all gaming this is this has been going on since since the monks controlled alcohol production in the middle ages you know this is it's a it's a currency Booze and drugs are a, are a currency and it's all about the money and so whatever the narrative is Whatever the, if something is, uh, is by the populace becoming a problem, the industry will find a way to morph it into the new product. It's Absolutely. just a new product line. Yeah. It's just, it has nothing to do with reality, never has. Right. And, and so we do have an entire culture of people that believe that drugs are powerful, cunning, living, problem solving. That are hell bent on our destruction. Yep. And, mm -hmm. and whatever it is they're experiencing or however that person narrates it in their own mind, there's a narrative in the marketing department that's going to make money off of that. Yeah. And, and it's not, it's not in most cases, a conspiracy or any, now with the Suboxone, it is make no mistake that this whole harm reduction thing has been turned into a nightmare. It's about lifelong adherence customers. Uh, and they were hoping that there wouldn't be overdoses but what's happening is because their narrative is that that suboxone will take away your craving because they don't understand it's a product of the mind they fucked up because now overdoses are even greater oh my More god people are on suboxone and it's turning into a shit show so, so sure. they're doubling sure. down I'm like what is that. your opinion about so do you think suboxone and methadone should never be given to people no i don't care what people take at all i think that that they that they should be given the truth they should be just given the truth. Hey, if you want to get off a of heroin and you want to use Suboxone for 14 days and it makes it easier to taper, fucking great. 
What right. a great thing. But if you, you feel like you want to use Suboxone for a year to, to transition yourself off of heroin, great. Right. What's happening is so ridiculous now in the pain realm because they're taking people who, by definition, don't have any, you know, I know you don't like the term addiction, but but oh yeah, they're not taking this medication despite negative results, right? You have a lot of pain patients who are just taking it, having a positive, and they're not on a high dose, right? They'll be on maybe like 15 milligrams of Percocet a day, and their doctors are so afraid of yes. the state medical board. They're putting these people on Suboxone, which is at a much higher dose. Right. And so they're taking people who really, if they stopped their Percocet, their pain would increase, but they would go through very, very minimal withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And now they're being given a medication that is harder to come off of that they didn't really need to begin with because they believe they had to demonize opioids. They had to demonize, which Suboxone is an opioid, right? But it's a different kind. So they had to demonize opioids for pain. They had to they had to get people to believe that it never helps. They had to get people to believe that to go after these doctors, they had to believe that the doctor, that that the person had zero choice in the matter at all. Uh, and they did it. They did it very, very well. And they I tell Claudia all the time. It, it flip-flops. They so did fast. It. It yeah. happened happen so quickly. Right. They didn't take addiction. They didn't, people who use drugs, they didn't take that and remove stigma. They just didn't. Exactly. They took that stigma and put it on every single person with pain also. Oh, we saw this coming in the early 2000s because because we we ran retreats from 1990 right, right up until just a, last year. And, and so... Back in the early 2000s, when we when we had three retreats, we had about 60 guests going at a time. I was overseeing the operations of the retreats. Um, nearly everybody that came in for opiates, the, the narrative wasn't, I got one pain pill and then I you know, became an addict. No, the, it, that was not the narrative back then. People just admitted that they you know took a couple pills at a party and they liked the feeling and so they just kept taking them and and so but when things started to shift was kind of like 2008 2009 and and all of a sudden as the narrative started to shift I, I was getting 50 and 60 year old people calling me who had been on pain management for years without a problem going calling me in tears like oh my god like I'm I'm an addict and I'm like what, what are you talking and about And they and Michelle now they're forcing pain patients just they, sign here saying you have opioid use disorder Oh right? my god So do you know what why it happened in 2008 that's when they first sued pharmaceutical company right. they That's sued the, the company that made um i think actique that and they so sued purdue for the first time right at that time and so they needed everyone to believe and i do i have to say like i have no proof of this but i do believe in divier does support cutting people off of their medication oh, because Lord then God. they're gonna have their product and i mean i talk we um hear from doctors all the time who are being investigated or fear of investigation. And there's one doctor, I'm not even going to say the state because I don't want him to get in trouble, but he does also sometimes uh, work in a detox hospital. And he tells me all the time, the vast majority, and he's, he means like almost everyone now who is coming in are people without addiction. These are people who have been on their pain medication, never had any issues and were completely cut off and their only option is Suboxone or Methadone at this point. And it's disgusting. It's it is disgusting. As soon as we saw this start to happen, Mark is like, oh, this is going to get ugly. This is going to people are going to be dying. And, and you know what everybody said to me at the time? They said they demonized me like crazy because the results weren't in yet. I said, I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to make a prediction. You're going to watch overdoses skyrocket. Yeah. You're going to watch this turn into a you need Suboxone for life. You can go. You can listen to podcasts. Oh, I, yeah. I made all these predictions because I knew. See, we always go back to one fundamental myth that if this myth was gone, all of this entire fucking narrative is gone. Yeah. And that is loss of control. Yeah. yeah. You know, so so until and, and you we know tackle Mark, that. They, they prey on these people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all poor people. Like yeah, the, they no. prey on poor people I mean, who I don't do, know any better. That's right. Like, I do think that there's a, like I said before, a bunch that goes into people who do develop these, um, the, the issue of addiction. And, and I know you don't agree with that word necessarily, but I do think, um, you know, poverty and like you look at the ACEs study and there are certain adverse childhood events that seem to lend itself to a whole lot of 
um, negative health outcomes, not just addiction, but other things in the future. Um, so well, I it's 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 ignorance. I mean, there's a certain amount of. I mean, I don't seem like stupidity, but I'm saying lack of education, sure, um, sure. lack of being informed. People are just not informed, right, right, of how the how things how they can be healthier and better their lives. Sure. Well, the government doesn't want better people, Michelle, right? No, the government's right. gonna well, you gotta hold the hold the man down. Don't let them know any better. Don't let them because, learn how to live a good lifestyle. The, the fact of the matter is the vast majority of people who use opioids are gonna stop on their own if they're not using it for pain. That's right. And the vast majority of these people, which no one wants anyone to know in this country, would do a lot better if they just had access to clean heroin. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna right. instead of Suboxone. You'll hear people say like Suboxone doesn't work as well for me as heroin, or I don't, it doesn't help me as much, or I just, it fizzles out. And I'm telling you, this idea of the hijacked brain is in, we've read, um, cause of course I'm obsessed with this nonsense cause I'm trying to fight it. And so I read a lot of the transcripts in the opioid litigation. And this concept of the hijacked brain is cited in every- Yeah, single book. yeah. So, so the-, the... You have to read Appendix B. It we okay. dis, we dismantled it, and it's now in textbooks. And uh, Stephen Slate wrote it. It's phenomenal. Go to um, the okay. clean clean slate dot org. Okay. And and it's there's Stephen such... Stephen's problem was heroin. Yeah. And uh, the the hijacked brain is so interesting because they tell you that in the studies, the brain scan studies, these people they said to the the study subjects. Okay, now you're gonna you're gonna stop, so we can measure. Right. Your, we're gonna measure the brain scan before, during, yeah. after. And here's what's so hilarious: <laughs> in the study, they're asking the people voluntarily stop, so we can get the brain scan post use. Yeah. The theory is that your brain's so yeah. changed you can't yeah. stop. <laughs> but these people are stopping and so, when their brain is most changed. And that's the thing, like they it's like like the own the, the very study to prove that you can't stop. It they ask them to stop. It proves that they do, a hundred percent of the time. Like they needed people to think, and they'll say all it takes is three days, and some of them say one day of opioids. Yeah of a prescription pain medication, opioids, your brain has changed, period. The chemistry changes and they use this nonsense oh, to yeah. show oh, yeah. we're going to, and this is the other part that I can't stand. Like, so because they have certain things that they say, which are false, then they're going to push this prohibition model, which has never, ever, 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 ever. ever. And then they're going to make all of this money by saying, now we have to do such and such to prevent addiction. We have to educate children. Yeah. They know the drugs. I mean, I was born in 70. I was a kid during the Nancy Reagan say no to drugs. It was an abject failure, yet a lot of this settlement funds is going to go into, like our country still pushes, educate the youth, say no to drugs, prevent addiction, and then you have other things like that we fight against risk score models. So everything is weaponized. They take the idea that women who were, who were sexually abused as children, yep. people who are poor, and even maybe whatever goes into it, because we don't know because it's black box, um, who have higher risk of addiction that they determine, now all of a sudden, none of these people could have their pain treated because that's they're going to become addicted. And that's what I, I, I mean. That's I, where that goes. I came into this realm because of, I have Crohn's disease and I get crowded kidney stones in 2017. I was denied opioids in the hospital <gasps> because I was abused as a child. 100% reason. That, I, and that's it, why... Yeah, and we have stories of women. They they won't let me because I was a domestic violence victim. They won't let me. So they take everything. Yes, of course. The movie Minority Report. It's like they, they're anticipating. Well, you can't. You are different, and so you can't have these things. Yeah. Oh my God, that's what yeah. a shame. And they really. It's I say I, they just prey on people. So I could. I would love to talk with you guys for three more hours. Uh, but so we're gonna we're gonna start to wrap this up a question for both of you mm -hmm. what's the one piece of advice you could offer someone struggling with substance use read our book read the book with an open mind next, okay an open mind read the book which brings me to the next question the quick what's the easiest way to get your book what's the website and and Beth's going to put put all of this in the um uh, the notes section how can people find you 
Well, they can find us at thefreedommodel.org. And pretty much all over social media, our, our name is The Freedom Model. And we have, Mark and I host the Addiction Solution Podcast. Great. And, and I'm going to give you an address that where they can get the book for free. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's freebook.freedommodel.org. Well, Michelle and Mark, it was so enlightening to sit down with both of you today. This is not an easy conversation to have. Uh, and for people who are using Matt successfully, this is certainly not a, you know, we're not, we didn't record this podcast to dissuade you folks. Uh, That's you, right. you, you continue to do what works for you. However, for people who no longer want to be on Matt, uh, the freedom model is a step in the right direction. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out of your day tuning into this episode of the Dr. Patient Forum podcast. Thank you for listening to our podcast. I'm going to leave you with just a few thoughts I had after finishing this podcast. It is my opinion that people should have access to a bunch of different things. You heard me earlier say if they want, want Suboxone or can use Suboxone, they should have access to Suboxone. People should have access to AA because it works for some people. I have read evidence. It shows that medication for opioid use disorder saves lives, has a much higher success rate than something like AA or NA and the history behind AA and NA can be a little convoluted, but people should be able to access what they need. It's the very same thing I think about pain. People should have access to medical marijuana. People should have access to Kratom. People should have access to prescription opioids. People should have access to physical therapy. People should have access to what works for them. But the thing that makes me really, really upset is that all the different industries that I just mentioned, they all seem to use demonizing the other industries to promote themselves. And that drives me insane. Even the creative industry, medical marijuana industry, you'll see them saying, well, our product is so much better than opioids because it's not addictive or blah, blah, blah. And they'll say, we'll solve the opioid crisis. So they're no better. The industry, not the product. The industry is no better than any other industry doing the same exact thing. I don't like when Indivia or Suboxone demonizes Vivitrol. I don't like when any company or organization or lobbyist demonizes any other to push their product. A lot of times when I say something about Purdue didn't cause the opioid crisis, I get attacked. And almost inevitably, people will have this knee-jerk reaction and they'll say, oh, you're probably being paid by Purdue and that's why and Purdue caused this and how could you support someone that killed so many people? And why don't you look at the way pharmaceutical and medical device industry works in this country? Just look at it across the board. Purdue didn't do anything differently than any other pharmaceutical company or medical device company has done for years. Years. Why don't you look at Pacera Pharmaceuticals? They're claiming to cure the opioid crisis. They just passed the No Pain Act. It's a very, very shady, unregulated, in my opinion, way that our country works where they pay doctors and they for consulting fees and all of that. And nobody has a problem with that. Now I'm gonna mention something that I'm sure I'm gonna get attacked for, but Michigan Open, University of Michigan, there's a doctor on that group board that is responsible or partly responsible for putting out post-op guidelines for adults and now recently for, for, for children. Now these guidelines are just guidelines, right? But they suggest the number of pills that people should get after surgery. You'd assume it would be lenient, well, it's not. It's like zero to five pills, and those are five milligram pills for huge operations. One of the gentlemen on this group is a paid consultant with Huron. Now, I'm sure he'll say, oh, well, I only got paid to study it or whatever, whatever, whatever. But here's the thing. He's associated with Huron Pharmaceuticals. Huron Pharmaceuticals is a direct competitor of Pacera Pharmaceuticals. Both make a long-acting numbing agent after surgery, right? It's not pain medication. It's a numbing agent, similar to lidocaine, novocaine, it's bubificaine, and a few other things thrown in there to make it slow release. Well, they both have promoted their product by demonizing opioids. And then you have that, the, like, Pasira joined forces with Gary Mandel, who did the same thing, and we're gonna demonize opioids to promote this product. This is what this country does. 
Why is everyone only hyper-focused on Purdue? Well, I have some ideas for that. People are hyper-focused on Purdue for once again because they want to make money off of the false narrative. Multi-district litigation has brought actually $54 billion into this country now. If you could put down prescription opioids, you are going to be able to promote so many things. Physical therapy, chiropractic, acupuncture, and, and also interventional pain. Epidural steroid injections, spinal cord stimulators, and of course, Suboxone, because if you can take everyone off of pain medication and they're on so-called high doses, I mean, what better thing to do than to put them on Suboxone, right? Doesn't matter if they have an opioid use disorder diagnosis because we're gonna make money off of this. Everyone just wants to make money. So it's interesting to me that all of these movies and documentaries and series about Purdue and OxyContin and this hyper-focus, like the one, I think it was called the crime of the century, but I'm gonna tell you something. The real, or was it the scam of the century? I don't know what it was called. But the real crime or scam of the century here is that they convinced the general public that prescription opioids is what's causing this crisis. And they did it to make a buck. Litigation narrative is what we call it. $54 billion in addition to industry funding, all of that industry to make a buck. You look at all the doctors who have been anti-opioid zealots. How many of them have made millions as expert witnesses in opioid litigation? Millions. So anyway, I, I realize that I probably am coming across kind of angry because I am. I'm livid. I'm furious. I'm so incredibly tired of industries taking advantage of people who are hurting, people who are grief stricken to make money. And we just buy it. We just buy it. So I'm just going to ask you, look into the facts yourself. Go on our website, go to Debunking Lies, see what the facts actually are, and email me if you have any questions. I simply ask that you be respectful if we disagree, I would love to have a discussion with you and maybe you can teach me uh, something that I'm, I'm seeing wrong. That I love that. I enjoy that kind of discussion. Sorry for this long disclaimer. Wasn't intended to be this long, but I think I feel a little better now. Thank you. Just a quick disclaimer that what you hear in our podcast is not to be considered medical or legal advice. We will always provide links in the show notes to give evidence for what we are saying. Thank you once again for listening to our podcast. If you're enjoying our podcast, please follow us on Spotify, leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and share with anyone that you think might benefit from this information.